Thank you, and, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, I'm just looking for the clicker. Here we are. And uh, the part I'm going to be talking about uh, picks up from uh, what you heard in the previous session about uh, data encryption and uh, how that can actually help you solve some of the problems uh, that you might experience in uh, IoT environments. Because uh, how many of you actually are concerned about a data breach in uh, IoT? Well, I didn't see all hands. Let me just put it in perspective because uh, just the, in the last couple of days, there, uh, there was a fine issued of $3.7 million on an IoT company for data breach on the device. And that's just for 200,000 devices. So uh, the fines are already popping up. So uh, if you're doing IoT, you should absolutely be concerned about the security aspect. It can make or break uh, the company very, very quickly. And <coughs> as we've seen, uh, IoT is really everywhere, whether it's uh, in the manufacturing world, uh, where it's on the shop floor, or uh, in the telecom sector. Mobile devices are nothing else than an IoT device. They're a bit more intelligent than the uh, standard ones where you can load apps and all the goodies, but uh, there are IoT devices for all matter of fact. And uh, there's pretty much no one that doesn't want to use IoT devices anymore. But it's not only uh, the wanting to use, it's also what threats are you looking at. Because when I see and talk uh, with people doing IoT and what do they do for security, oh yeah, we do all the uh, standard security measures. They're focusing on the bottom part which is good, which is actually very good. You need to focus on that part. But that leaves the whole two-third of the component out of the equation. Because you're not only looking at the IoT uh, backend, you also have uh, typically some mobile application. And everybody that has a corporate email on mobile devices knows uh, how difficult it is already to protect those. And there have been breaches on that part. Like uh, when uh, a vehicle was breached, all that was necessary is, uh, yeah, install the app, change the serial number, or the VIN number in this case, and that was really difficult to get. Just walk into the parking lot, pick it up from the windshield, enter it into the, uh, the device, and voila, I can control the other car. Perfect. That's uh, good security design. But what you also see is, uh, and that was uh, the other aspect where the fine was issued, actual breaches on the device. And we've seen those for the DDoS attack, which uh, by itself didn't reveal any data, but it's still bad because uh, now uh, if you want to do DDoS, you have a scale you never experienced before because before you used computers you infiltrated. There's about 10 times as many devices out there. Why not use those? way more efficient and nobody's going to notice because uh, there is no McAfee uh, or uh, Norton installed on those devices. So uh, they uh, operate at a big problem space. Or if that device is actually a medical device, well, infiltrating that one might actually lead to the death of a person. Well, in that case, the fine might be higher than the $3.7 million just issued for the uh, recently. So you have a lot more threat vectors to consider in IoT than you typically have with a normal IT environment. But that's not all. Now you also have to look at uh, with IoT, your devices are going to be spread globally. One aspect that just happened is uh, the uh, data privacy regulations, or uh, GDPR for short, uh, out of EMEA. And next year, everybody has to be compliant with it. And that means you have to apply security throughout the ecosystem. And if you don't, and there's a data breach, they can find the company of 4% of top line revenue. Not your profits, it's your actual revenue that they can uh, take as a base. So the fines, if you're a startup company, are gonna be so bad that it could put you out of business. So at that point, you really have to think through what do you, uh, because they say security has to be integrated into everything, front to back. And when they talk front to back, and, uh, if you look at IoT, it doesn't mean the infrastructure only. It means everything.
one way the uh, part actually calls it out on uh, GDPR, encryption is a very good way to actually do that. Now, encryption has been around a long time, and I'm going to show you something really interesting, what uh, is not the encryption from the 20 years ago that you probably all remember, which all has to do with TLS and public-private keys and the like. But uh, important here is uh, that our encryption meets those requirements as well. But what does that really mean? Now, uh, as I already said, there's been enough data breaches on IoT, whether it's connected vehicles, as I just uh, uh, demonstrated by entering on the mobile device, or uh, uh, the uh, DDoS attack, so you really should be scared about it. Today, the attackers uh, are there to make money, therefore hire. So what does that mean? They are looking for data, which probably means you're right focusing right now still on the back-end infrastructure because that's what they're after. They're not really necessarily after on uh, the device and the find that was issued is based on a research that was uh, demonstrated at DEF CON last year. And uh, at DEF CON they uh, showed how to remotely control the device from anywhere without having any access to uh, the mobile app. So uh, at that point, yes, it could be bad but uh, the attackers themselves are not looking at the device, except for the DDoSing that happened. But uh, that's going to shift because the attackers are for hire. And if I'm for hire, I go to the highest bidder. And if somebody asks me to do something, infiltrate that medical device. Or let's take another example. Are you connected often? It's a good idea to have IoT at home, and I, I do as well. But what if my uh, gas range is an IoT device? The attacker infiltrates the device, opens the gas valve, doesn't have to ignite yet. That's not what I really wanted. But uh, when I get home, switch the light on, I have a serious incident. The fire department is going to come. They're going to uh, go through everything. And what is the conclusion on their side? It probably was a malfunction in the oven. Hmm, that's not really what happened. But uh, somebody just got away with a physical attack without being detected. So uh, IoT can have serious side effects that people have to be aware of. And baking, uh, uh, those breaches will happen more and more. And when you look at the uh, obstacles where people say, why, why I'm not uh, deploying IoT yet, it's a lot of to uh, with the security environment. I'm not 100% sure it meets my security needs uh, in there. It is absolutely number one. Security is the biggest concern. I have IoT, and I took additional measures on my network to make sure it's going to be safe, because I don't trust the device manufacturers to do everything necessary to protect me but the average user is not. And why do actually people care about the encryption side? It's the biggest bang for the buck, ultimately. It's easy to implement, and it gives you a lot of security. And why, what are they looking at uh, from an encryption perspective? And I talked about the GDPR, baking encryption into your whole ecosystem. And the previous speaker mentioned as well that uh, encryption for, uh, should be part of what you're doing. That's one of the principles that uh, he mentioned. But uh, what do you think when I talk encryption? I guess you all think about the AES-CBC mode, the block cipher encryption, So, which is really good. It does a good way of encryption. But if I have a date, a social security number, a name, or uh, I have blood pressure and the like, and I encrypt it with CBC, I get useless information. I can't act on it. I can't decide if uh, this is good or bad. But uh, there's a new form of encryption that has been approved by NIST with special publication 800-38G, which defines format-preserving encryption. And it is a form of AES. It's as safe as any AES 256-bit uh, encryption. And that actually can encrypt any format in a way that the end result maintains that format. So if I have a date, I still have a date afterwards. I can, uh, using our technology, I can actually go and encrypt the relationship between dates. So think of it uh, in a hospital. 
your date of admission, your date of uh, diagnostic, your date of uh, uh, treatment, and your date of release are four uh, events that you need to know the delta between. They can be encrypted so that the delta is maintained. That gives you all the analytical capabilities behind it. So at that point, you don't lose the value that is inside the data. But the other good part, because it is encryption, it guarantees referential integrity. If I encrypt the same value with the same key, I get the exact same result. And it's reversible. So if you do your analytics and identify that uh, there is a need to act on a result, you don't, uh, like in traditional data masking solutions, somebody has to rerun the information to get the actual live data. Here, you can just take the results at decrypt, act. But the person looking and doing the analytics is not exposed. So anybody that actually works on the data, sees the data, whether it's uh, on uh, the disk, whether it's in memory, whether it's uh, on uh, screen, whether it's on the wire, the data is encrypted all the time. That provides a very good way to help you, for example, on GDPR, because you can do that from the device into the back end on the mobile system. So all through its life cycle, your data could be encrypted in memory, on the wire, and uh, in storage. And that is uh, far better because uh, the previous speaker mentioned uh, you should do it on storage. No, you shouldn't do it on storage only, because that's only a limited safety net. The only thing you protect is somebody stealing a disk drive. But how many hackers recently have gone into uh, a data center, took the drives out of the server, and ran away with it? I think that happened about 10 years ago. It's not a typical attack vector anymore. And why is this important? Because look at your traditional uh, security measures that you do. Number one is like uh, you build different layers of protection. You have uh, the uh, disk encryption, you have database encryption, you have authentication management. And every time you do that, you only protect a certain layer and a certain attack vector. Even if you do database encryption, what do you achieved? Yes, my administrators no longer can see the data. But my users can, which is good. Oh, by the way, so can be the malware which uses SQL injection. So you're not really protecting everything because uh, you need to protect the data throughout its life cycle, wherever it is. Because if this data is encrypted, it is encrypted uh, whether the user sees the data or the administrator, it's encrypted all the time. So this gives you a much cleaner security that doesn't uh, impose additional problems in uh, your workflows. So let me give you an example here on uh, some leading telecommunications providers. They actually do that on a daily basis uh, at massive scale. I think this is already a little bit outdated uh, because uh, their Hadoop ecosystem now spans about 1,500 nodes. So <coughs> they collect data from cell towers, cell phones, uh, any time you pay your bill, everything goes back into that big Hadoop as well as Teradata backend infrastructure to analyze, give you 360 view, but also to actually uh, help them better understand network utilization, what they need to improve, how they need to improve, uh, if they need to throttle you, anything like that is always uh, done in real time in their environment. The way they do that today is uh, they actually take the data in, and when it comes in at the edge, they actually today use NiFi, uh, another change that they just recently done, to actually take the data as it is received from the cell tower, streamed into their back end. They encrypt this information in the right at the IT edge to actually take the data in and then uh, put it into Hadoop, do some data cleansing, whatever they need to do as well, so that the analysts that actually work in this ecosystem to identify issues or anything, never have an idea what customer they deal with, what is the actual cell tower, what is the geolocation, what is uh, the IMI number which uniquely identifies uh, your phone or an IP address that you've been using. All of that is encrypted so that the analyst is in no circumstance able to identify who he's dealing with. He shouldn't. What is he looking for? 
He's not going to go out to fix something or change something on a cell tower. Why does he need to know? There's absolutely no reason for that. And this infrastructure enables them to do that. And there's quite some, uh, some data records on there. So for big data ingestion and uh, something, uh, the traditional way people have been doing that is you collect your data into a staging area, put that, uh, use tools, typical ETL tools, uh, to uh, get data into big data from internal data sources like uh, Scoop or Informatica or whatever you've been uh, choosing. But uh, that's old school from what I've seen. People are moving more to a real-time environment and take some of the easy decision making out of a big data environment. You don't need uh, a heavy map reduce job or heavy hive query to identify that uh, if you use IoT in the home, that uh, if I have a motion sensor and uh, light switches automatic and temperature uh, sensors, then uh, <coughs> well, if there's motion in the room and it's dark outside uh, and uh, it's cold, it might actually be good to switch on the lights and actually raise the temperature. That could be automatic. Do I need Hadoop to make that heavy decision? Probably not. You can offload that into uh, NiFi. It's an easy decision-making process that can happen in real time outside of the big data environment. So that's what more and more people are doing. The telecom provider doing the same with the streaming data from uh, the infrastructure. But we're talking IoT. And uh, so here's uh, another example on uh, the more on the IoT side, uh, in this case, connected vehicles. They have a similar problem. Their big goal is basically uh, customer experience. They had trouble with uh, recalls in the past. They wanted to improve the recall experience for and foremost. So uh, for that, you need to collect tons of data. You need to collect all your manufacturing data. And uh, when you're a big car manufacturer, you're operating on a global scale. So uh, you have to deal with a lot of different regulations because not all your parts are coming where the car is uh, manufactured. They're coming from all over the globe. So at that point, you need to have uh, data privacy regulations in the different countries. So what they've been doing as well is use NIFI to pick up data in country, encrypt the information in country, and send it to a central Hadoop repository. They also get data from outside sources, whether it's dealerships, whether it's uh, NHTSA about accident information and investigation complaints uh, and the like. This is all fed into their big data ecosystem as well. And during that time, it gets encrypted using format preserving encryption because pieces like the VIN number, dates, owner information, dealership information is all sensitive. So they all encrypt this information as it is collected into the big data environment. But it's not only that part of the data. They also take data from vehicles as they drive down the road. Every 15 minutes, the vehicle sends information back to the backend infrastructure about what's happening inside the vehicle. They take that data, which is about uh, 2 billion events a day, and actually, as that data is streamed in, they can make real-time decisions in their system that, uh, oh, by the way, we have four vehicles uh, driving down the road that should be under a particular recall because there's an issue with the fuel pump. What have manufacturers done in the past? They issued a recall for hundreds of thousands of vehicles because uh, they expect four fuel pumps to be bad out of the hundred thousand, but they couldn't tell which. Ah. I can tell which one, but I can also tell, based on your driving patterns, that your brake pads are going to be out next week. So what about if I set up a service appointment for you, make sure the dealer has the part that you specific to your vehicle, a loaner available for you, so I can send you an email, can you please drop off the car so we can replace the brake pads for you, and uh, there's a loaner, and you can pick up the car in the evening, all said and done. That's a much nicer experience as well than driving to the dealership because a light came on. So there's a lot of improvement that uh, they are working on and implementing, and they're actually doing a lot uh, closer to uh, the vehicle as well. But uh, all the data here as well is encrypted. So the analysts 
that actually work on it and trying to identify new patterns and new ways uh, to, uh, to do some of those parts, they work on encrypted data. They have no idea what dealership they, uh, they see, what uh, VIN number they see, what person they're working on, which is a key aspect. Because uh, in these environments, it's not as sensitive. But if you're thinking about uh, some other aspects, when it's about fraud, there's been always the, uh, the case that uh, fraud departments and the outside uh, sources have been working with people in the fraud department to keep them off the list. Well, <coughs> because those people see live data. They should not. Because if that person only sees the encrypted data, he can, anybody can approach them. There's no way they can identify the actual person having fraud because what they do from a process, they hand it off to the fraud department. Whatever goes into that department is on record. There's no way to change that after that. So at that point, you took a whole team out of uh, possible attack vectors into your organization. And the less people that have live access, which is probably 5% of your general population needs access to some parts of the data, that's a good thing because it reduces your risk. You can focus on those five if there is a data breach problem. Everybody else, because the hacker taking that data, what does he have? Encrypted data. What can you do with encrypted data? Nothing. So at that point, and that's what GDPR, for example, says. They say if you have a data breach, you have to disclose the data breach within 72 hours. Failure to do so is a violation already, which gets you under the fine. So uh, if you know of a data breach, 72 hours, unless the data is encrypted. Well, who doesn't like a get out of jail free card? Here's one. Encrypt the data because that removes your risk for fines. So going back to the uh, the threat vector again. Now what can you what can and should you do? Yes, if I look at uh, my IT infrastructure all the data should be encrypted all the time, not just at rest. That's old school and doesn't protect you. Because uh, improper disposal of disk drives or stealing a disk drive, that's not a major concern anymore longer. It's really about all the people that have access to your data. So you can do all of that. I didn't talk a lot about the, uh, the top part, but we have similar the same technology, format-preserving encryption, that can be used on cell phones and that can be used in IoT devices that could be embedded in the uh, IoT device. So you can actually encrypt your information inside the phone, inside the uh, actual device, whether it's a vehicle or an uh, intelligent fridge or anywhere in your ecosystem. So the data is encrypted through where it's generated, wherever it's processed, wherever it is used, it's encrypted. So an attacker, when they uh, actually go and uh, taking my mobile phone, I want to put in the VIN number. I need to put in an encrypted VIN number. Oops. How do I get the, I can read that VIN number, but it's not acceptable for the application because it's encrypted. It doesn't match to what it is expecting. I can use it, uh, do it format preserving, so some parts might look clear, some parts might not. So at that point, I've taken an attack vector out of the equation, even so the data is available, even in the storage device, like on the mobile phone. But it can be done in the IoT device as well, or even, if you want to go one step further, on the communication channel. So when you send commands to your IoT device, say, switch on, switch off, or whatever the operations are, you can encrypt it in a way that it still looks like the original command in, from a string perspective. Might have the, it has the same length, so your logic doesn't break. But it's an encrypted value, and it's unique to the device. So <coughs> the breach that I was talking that just happened recently is by understanding the protocol as well. So uh, if I understand the protocol for one device, I understand it for all devices. That's what DDoS uh, uh, as well is relying on. So if I understand one device, I have all. What do I get now? I can breach one device, 
but that does not allow me to operate another device. So at that point, I've got nowhere. I breached my device, that's good, maybe, but I'm nowhere to controlling somebody else's device. So that's an important aspect to consider when looking at uh, security as well, because uh, your protocol, they're good and safe to some part, but once somebody understands the protocol, they can start operating the device very easily. And this prevents that. So there's a lot that uh, format preserving encryption can actually help you do in your environment. With that, I want to uh, thank you. Any questions? And by the way, we do have uh, a booth over there as well, or a tabletop. And I would be happy to talk more about uh, how we can help you in your IoT deployments. Thank you. Give a big hand to the talk. And we have something for oh. you.